Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for your patience. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Today insha'Allah we continue the second part of the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Everybody knows the story of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Or so they think they do. Alhamdulillah, I think all of us know it, except I want to touch on a higher order thinking in the story of Ibrahim and what it means to us. To recap last week, for those who weren't here, we spoke about the beginning of the life of Ibrahim salam growing up, where he was from, his father, his relationship with his father, and how his father rejected him, and how Ibrahim salam taught us the manners and etiquettes of how to talk to our parents, even if they oppose you in religion, even if they're nasty to you, what to do in that case. Then we spoke about Ibrahim salam's dealing with his people. And we learned ways of how to talk and make people understand and give and take, try to bring about educational arguments, not just haphazard talk for the sake of arguing. We talked about the nature of people when they know the truth, but they don't want to know the truth and what is their sign and how, how do you know that they're just not listening and when to move away or change the topic. We spoke about uh, Ibrahim salam's approach. We said that his approach was uh, seemed a little bit harsh for our day today, but we spoke that it depends on the type of people that you're talking to. And you can't look at Ibrahim salam and take all his mannerisms of how he spoke to his people and you say, I can talk the same. If that was the case, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would be the first to take the example of his father Ibrahim وسلم, and speak to his people the same way. But obviously the Quraysh were different to the people of Babylonia. And the way he spoke to them was very different. Also, we said that Ibrahim وسلم, was the only Muslim in the world. And he didn't have an authority. And his father was a very noble, respected man. They made the idols. They manufactured them. So Ibrahim salam had to talk a little bit more clearer to his people and he had to make it sort of, he had to use really uh, smart ways of conveying his message where it sticks in their brain and he was really caring for them. All of this happened when he was still a child, like almost a child or a teenager. And then we said finally that uh, he did not lie, he did not really lie because this is a very interesting uh, question that some people ask me. They say, if little kids ask me this and teenagers, he get, they go, you know the word wallah, wallah. When we want to prove a point, we say, when the person doesn't believe us, we say wallah. Isn't that correct? It's not good to use that word too often. But anyway, sometimes, because I'm a teacher, the students say uh, they lie. And then to convince you, they use the word wallah. But what they do is they secretly change the word. So they add a little letter to it or they... Uh, whisper something else, all right? So they say, for example, Wallah, I didn't do it um, yesterday, yesterday. Or they go, Wallah. So they only say Wallah. And they think that by changing the word, they got out of it. Let me explain something to you. Whatever you say, the intention that you want the other person to think is what is counted for you. Whether you say wallah or no wallah, whether you sign it or signal it, doesn't matter what you say. What is the message that you are giving to the person? If that's your intention, to give him that, to make him think that you are saying wallah over it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in your heart, man. Don't be crazy. Allah knows everything in your heart, so you can't hide things from him. So again, a lie is a lie if the message that gets to the other person seems like it's the truth, but they don't know that it's a lie. Okay? Clear? Can't play around with the words in Islam. That's why Allah says, He knows what's in your heart. He knows you're open and you're secret. And everything on the Day of Judgment will be brought out. And you'll say, why? Why? Allah will say to you, it was a secret then, but today there is no secrets. Secondly, Ibrahim alayhi salam did not lie to his people when he said, do you know the story about the big idol? He said the big statue killed all the other statues. Remember what we said? He broke the old... I talked about this last week. Everybody knows the story when he comes in and he breaks the idols and says the big one, the big idol is the one that killed all the other idols and he hung the axe on his neck. You all know the story, yes? Yes? Good. Did he lie? No. He did not lie. Why? Because 
His people knew that he was making it up. And he knew that they knew that he was making it up. It was very clear. Isn't that correct? And you see the response in the Quran is like this. They said, Qad alimta. You knew already. They don't speak. He goes, ask them if they can speak. He said, you know that they don't speak. <laughs> they started realizing their stupidity, what they're saying. What does that tell you? That he didn't really lie. So anybody who says Ibrahim Azam lied and then we come to use it. Why am I saying this? Because some people that love to twist and use ways to do the wrong thing. And then sometimes if you can find a way to twist the meanings of a religion or to use a prophet in the wrong way, you will not. This is ignorance. And we are accusing the prophets of being liars. However, it was a strategy. It was a hujja, which means uh, an educational argument for them to learn. And he wanted the benefit for them. Everybody understand that? After that, they got angry and they put him in a catapult and threw him into a big fire. They said, Burn him and save your gods. Subhanallah. Aliha means gods that are worshipped. As soon as you say the word ilah in Arabic, it means you worship that. You bow to it, you prostrate to it, you seek from it, you ask it, you give it its offerings, you swear by it. All these things means it's an ilah. So he said, they said, save your gods. From who? From who? Ibrahim, السلام, a 12-year-old boy. How is he going to destroy your gods? And save what gods? They're already destroyed. He can't keep doing that. He can just rebuild them anyway. So what do they mean by save your gods? Support your gods? The ideology. The ideology. Correct. It's not the actual statues they worship. It's the, they call the spirit or the ideology that they were worshipping. And you know what? This is for a lot of people. Today they say, we don't live in ideology anymore. Nobody worships statues anymore. Although they do around the world. But here in the West they say there's no idolatry. This is stupid and this ancient stuff. You see, the thing is, it's not about the idol. The idol means nothing to anybody. It's the ideology, correct. It is the belief that you are destroying. And this symbol obviously creates doubt in people. They make them question. So, save your gods, meaning silence this young boy. What's a young boy going to do? You're a whole world. You're a whole nations after nations. You are millions of people. And yet this one little boy is going to cause you guys to lose all your faith and belief. Yes, one young boy. It's not the young boy. What is it? It's the truth. The truth is the most powerful thing in the universe. Even if the false looks like it's beating it, the truth, you don't even have to do anything. The truth shows itself in time. That's why Allah says, Al-Haqq wa wa kul Al-Haqq wa al-Baqid. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa reconquered Mecca, he went into Mecca and he broke those idols that were in there that were not supposed to be there from the time Ibrahim السلام, built it. Allah sent the verse and say, the haq has now arrived. And the batil, the false, is just dissolves. Ja'a mean the haq has now reached us. So the truth is always working. It's always walking. And the false goes really far and then it dies out. My brothers and sisters, that's why this young boy, they wanted to kill him and they wanted to silence the truth and save their false ideology. Brothers and sisters, having said this, let me tell you something. The people of Babylonia, they did know that there is a God. Like they worship the one true God. Yeah. And they believed in the one true God who created the universe. They called him Rabb. But what did they do? They didn't believe that he has the only right to be the only God worshipped. Other gods can be worshipped for other reasons. Even a human being of authority like a king can be can share godhood with god that's what they that's what they believe and the way they used to justify was like this the king of the land he's not the god of the world but he has the right to make his own laws and god, you know and even if it means against the laws of the real god so he is the god of the land they used to call him the god of the land the rabb of the land it's like pharaoh pharaoh says i don't know any other god for you he believed in the true god he believed in god it's supernatural stuff uh, to him and to and and he believed in the ultimate creator but he also believed that he is a god worthy of worship on earth meaning in his kingdom he gets to legislate he gets to make laws and no other law is above his not even god's law therefore he is worshipped he says i am your god worship my laws and that was the people of babylonia they were polytheists they made partners with god how 
They believed in the creator of the universe. They made these statues that kind of, they're named after noble people that, you know, like call them saints, that they thought through them God will love us more and he'll listen to our dua more, right? And they made the king, his name was Nimrod. He was in Babylonia, in Iraq. They made him the lord, the god of, po of politics and their social laws. He gets to make all the laws and God, his laws are not important. And therefore they made him another god. Because who is the only right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a law to follow and we come and say, no, no, we'll, we'll just keep that aside. And, you know, it's got nothing to do with, with ruling, uh, you know, other laws in the land. Then it's as if we're saying, God, your law is not appropriate. It's not good. Um, we don't want it. And, uh, you know, there's no room for it. So we can become gods ourselves to make our own laws above your law. That's, that's Islam, yeah. Now, obviously, there are necessities in situations where you can't, you have to follow a particular law like in Australia. You don't go and fight it, you know, if you're refugees here. But at the end of the day, in your heart, you know that Allah's law is above all laws. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when they threw him into the fire, there is only one authentic story about him thrown, being thrown into the fire. And that is the Hadith in Bukhari. He said, as soon as he was placed in the catapult, he said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. My Lord, Allah is enough. And he is the best to rely on. And then he was thrown. As a result, Allah said, Wa qulna ya na rukuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. And so we said, O fire, be cool and be peaceful on Ibrahim. And so the fire did not burn him and it was peaceful in there. There are other stories and the brother actually pointed out something important for me last week. And he said, well, there's a story which I mentioned that the angels came to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Jibreel came to him alayhi salam and he said to him, do you want me to help you? And he said, from you, no. And then Mikael came, do you want me to help you? He said, from you, no. And then Israfil, from you, no. And then he said, enough is Allah for me. That narration, my dear brothers and sisters, I actually went back to research it and found there really is no authentic, reliable source to it. Okay. And Ibn Taymiyyah says they are mostly Israelite traditions from the Talmud, from the time of the Jews. The Jews talk a lot about Ibrahim alayhi salam. But there's no authentic narration from our Prophet about that. Because the brother opened up a point and he said, well, if, if the angel came to him from God to help him, isn't that a support from Allah anyway? Like it means that we can sit down and say, I don't need any help. You know that story about, there's a, that story, I don't know if it's halal to say about that guy who said, oh God, help me when a flood happened. It's a joke. And then the water reaches his legs and some people come on a boat and they say to him, come up on the boat, come on a boat, we'll save you. And he says, no, no, I've asked God to save me, I've asked God to save me. And then the water reaches his shoulder and then a helicopter comes and they let down the ladder and they said, come up, come up. And he said, no, no, I've asked God to save me, I've asked God to save me. And then he dies, right? He drowns. Now, it's a, it's a joke and some kids say it and they say, oh, he was raised and he sort of got upset. Why didn't God help him? And that he said to him, I sent you a boat and I sent you a helicopter and I sent you, I don't know what, and you didn't accept it. You know, what, do you want? what do you want? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps you in different ways, right? When you ask him. But when we expect Allah to help us in a particular way, then obviously and it's not the right way to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps you in different ways. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam made dua, oh Allah, help me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded by telling the fire, O oh fire, be cool and be peaceful. Brothers and sisters, can a fire be cool and peaceful and not burn someone? Scientifically, scientifically, only temporarily you can make a fire not burn for a little while. You can actually put your hand in it through doing some sort of experiment, some, something, and it won't burn you for maybe a few minutes. They use it in movies as well. Like for example, you can get a dollar note, right? a ten dollar note for example, and you can put um, salt and water and alcohol in a solution, stir it, and then put a, dollar, a note in there, all right? Soak it, soak it, and then wait a little bit, not for too long, and then light it up. 
and it'll burn, but it won't burn the actual note. Right? And after that, it'll probably extinguish because there's water in the note. And what it does is it burns the alcohol because the alcohol rises, it goes above the, um, above the water, so it burns the alcohol. So I'm just stating that there are some ways you can make the fire not burn for a little while. So if a human being can think of ways that a fire can temporarily not burn, what about the creator of the fire? Doesn't he know how to create something in all these atoms and these molecules to change the fire, not to burn Ibrahim and to be peaceful upon him? He can. Of course he can. Allah gives an example about the resurrection when you are raised on the day of judgment. What does he say? He says, look, if you don't believe that I can raise you up from bones and ashes after you are dead and turned into soil, then consider this evidence from Allah in the Quran. Consider this. Have you ever seen a land that became dead over time, over the years? And nothing ever grew there for hundreds, thousands of years. Look, suddenly we bring it back to life. Crops grow, trees grow. There are these that we have seen on earth. Geologists, scientists, environments, all these types of scientists, they tell you this. And they call it evolution. But Allah SWT says, returning life from death. Allah says, don't you see a land that can become dry, has no water ever, and then suddenly we bring clouds one day upon it, the rain falls, and behold, it starts moving and becoming alive. Just like that, Allah will raise you again after you die too. Aren't you made of the same elements of earth? Don't you have atoms and molecules like the rest of the earth? Just like Allah made the plants grow, He can make you and your molecules come together and grow in the same way. And then Allah says, كَمَا بَدَأَكُمْ تَعُودُونَ Again, didn't you come here into the world from absolutely nothing? Alright, from fluid. Where was the fluid? Allahu Alam. Didn't you come from nothing? Suddenly you're here? Allah says, just the way He started you from nothing, I think it's easier for Allah to start you again from something. Isn't that right? So, just like that. Allah SWT tells us He can do all this stuff. We see it before our eyes, the miracles happening. Allah says, How many signs in the heavens and the earth do they pass by and they turn away from? My brothers and sisters in Islam, and so He was thrown into the fire. He stayed in there before their eyes, and they thought He had burnt. And after the fire was extinguished, He comes out right before their eyes. And only one person believes in Him. His name was Lut. His cousin. Only one person believed. Do you know why they didn't want to believe? They believed. Like they, they believe what they see. They believe that he came out of the fire. They believed that this is a miracle. They did believe that. But guess what the problem was? They refused to declare that they believe. They chose to follow the false deliberately. This is the arrogance that Allah talked about. Iblis started off like that. Remember in the beginning of our story? Same thing. He's doing the same trick with the people. Arrogance, ego, biggest evil of man. Brothers and sisters in Islam, there is a little story that it says that frogs used to come to the fire. If you've heard that story, they'd bring water and they start to, they tried to extinguish the fire. And that the lizard used to try to blow wind on the fire to make it bigger. And this story, some, you even find in some books uh, of past Islamic books, uh, I don't know where it came from. They say that the Prophet ﷺ said, this is an authentic hadith, which is in Ibn Majah. He said, do not kill. He said, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not kill shrikes. Shrikes is a type of uh, predator bird. It looks a little bit like a, a hawk, but it has a few more colors. Do not kill shrikes. Frogs. Ants and woodpeckers. Hadith is in Ibn Majah and Sahih by al -Bani. And some, uh, some, I don't know, interpreters, they come up and they say, oh, that's because the frog wanted to extinguish the fire on Ibrahim and the lizard wanted to make it worse, right? And so you should kill the lizard and never kill the frog. I don't know where they got this idea from. 
but there's no origin to it really. There, there are some narrations, but there is, it's, they're all weak and unauthentic. But Prophet did say, do not kill the frog and the shrike and the ants and the woodpecker. And there are other hadiths about the bee and other things, right? Now, I don't know, we don't know the wisdom why he said that in that time. It could be maybe that people were hunting them a lot. And then he said, don't do it because it was happening a lot. But Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. It's not because of that. All the animals of Allah worship Allah. Allah says, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ There is nothing except that worships Allah. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِحَهُمْ You cannot understand their glorifications. Everything praises Allah. And Prophet used to say, if it wasn't for the creatures of the earth who glorify Allah night and day, Allah would not send provision down onto earth as a result of the evil people who do wicked acts. And if it wasn't for the people who glorify Allah as well. But he also mentioned the creatures on earth. He wouldn't give you water. But it's for them, out of mercy to the creatures and the insects and all that. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the word, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. What a beautiful word that is. Allah is enough for me. And He is the best to rely on. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Qalaha Ibrahim. Hinama ulqiya fin nar. In Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. He said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil is a word that Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam said when he was thrown into the fire. Wallahi, any person who says it in any hardship they are in, Allah will relieve them. I have to make a note about that, however. Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al-wakil comes with conditions. All the prophets understood it and there is no scholar who does not misunderstand it. Only lay people misunderstand it. What is it? You can't just sit there and just say the word and think that all harm is going to go away from you. And all your hardships are going to go away. No. You have to do what you can within your ability that Allah gave you. And then say the word to remind you. To remind you to be courageous and keep going. And keep being positive, even if negative things come towards you. The whole idea is to give you strength, mental strength, emotional strength, physical strength. Isn't that correct? Who goes to the gym here? Where is he? Gym man. I'm sure you say things when you're lifting, right? It motivates you, isn't that correct? We listen to things sometimes. The halal nasheeds. <laughs> halal. And then you lift the weights. Or it doesn't it? It makes your hormones go berserk, it doesn't it? Lifts your testosterone level. Is that correct? Adrenaline rush. Yeah, it makes a mood. When you say words that connect you to the true Allah, like all that other stuff is just made up by people, but when you say words that are true and real, your adrenaline should be even greater. And your positiveness and your courage and your bravery in life and your moving forward should be even stronger. Has to be Allah. Allah is enough for me and he's the best to rely on. What is the condition? The common statement as the Sahabas is to say, I'aqal wa tawakkal. I'aqal which means tie your camel and then rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also means to think with your brain too because the brain is called the aql. Think, do, do what you can and then rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't that correct? Uh-huh. And we gave a very good example last week about Maryam alayhi salam. Maryam who gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. She's pregnant. In labor. In labor. Men, you have no idea. We have no idea. We have no idea. The sisters know what is labor. And she's sitting underneath this palm tree. There's no one around her. And then Isa alayhi salam, to the correct opinion, he says, shake the trunk of the palm tree. This is a woman in labor, and she's got to shake the trunk of the palm tree, and he says, dates will fall. An elephant can't shake the trunk of a palm tree, let alone a woman in labor. She's got to shake it so hard that the dates will fall. (laughs) Subhanallah. But she touched it and Allah made the dates fall. Because she can't control the dates. She can't control anything else, but she did what she can. In labor, she still had to do something. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one one can give this excuse saying, oh, I'll just sit back and play games and fiddle around with, you know, Play games with myself and just expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me everything. No, it doesn't happen that way. Didn't Allah give you eyes? Didn't He give you ears? Didn't He give you hands? Didn't He give you legs? Didn't He give you energy? Didn't He give you life? All of that is from Allah. I mean, he's giving you this help. You're going to end up like that guy who says, help, 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 boat and helicopter and everyone came to him still thinking Allah's going to help him. Of course He helped him by sending you these faculties to work with. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? So let's not see people sitting lazy backwards and giving all sorts of excuses. 
This brother once sent me a joke. He goes, all the, all the corpses that have died, all the corpses in Mount Everest, you know, all the people who tried to reach the top of Mount Everest, all the corpses that have died one day used to be highly motivated people. Lesson learned. Laziness pays. Be lazy. Otherwise, you'll die like those guys. These are people who make up excuses. All right? Not to be motivational. Make up all these excuses. So don't be like that. Don't sit back. A mu'min has to be strong and moving forward, inshallah. Ibrahim alayhi salam then couldn't do anything more. So he left the people and made dua for them. One of the worst things that happened to Ibrahim alayhi salam is his own father telling him, I will stone you to death even. And you have to leave unless you leave. And he tried his best, but his father told him, get out or I will stone you. He was, his life was at, at risk. So he had to leave. And even while he was leaving, he says, Father, I'll make dua for you, for Allah to forgive you. Brothers and sisters, our parents, there are people who convert to Islam. There are people who repent. There are people who come from Muslim families, but they're not very practicing. And you become practicing. And it becomes very difficult for a lot of people, you know, in, 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 in these situations. What do you do? You always remember Ibrahim alayhi salam. How about our relationship with our family and our parents? You don't abandon them. You don't abandon them just because they have a different belief to you. Gosh. Listen, brothers and sisters. Allah says, We commanded people and advised them, remind them to be good towards their parents. Right? And then afterwards Allah says, And if they were to strive hard against you, to make partners with me or to disbelieve in me, things that you, um, you know, to, to make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and become ignorant, that he said, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Do not obey them. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا But still remain their companion in life in a goodly manner. No matter what they say, try your best to be good to them. Try to, if you have to have boundaries, you can have boundaries, but don't cut off your communication with them. You never know. Allah may have sent you as a guide for them. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I heard of very many families who went through this strife 20 years later, some of them tell me, Alhamdulillah, my father, my mother now accept, although they don't accept my belief, but they accept and they defend Muslims and they defend me and they treat me so much better because they say I've changed and I've become a better person. 20 years later, subhanAllah, some people two years later, one sister, she went after becoming a Muslim, 14 members of her family became Muslim. So you never know where the guidance is. Such is life, my brothers and sisters, it's a test. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all. My brothers and sisters, Ibrahim alayhi salam, therefore is all about Tawheed. And all about trials and tribulations. When you follow the truth, it comes with tests. When you follow the false, well, you'll find a lot of people who support you because they also want to play and muck around. You know, when you're in class, it's so easy to slap off and get supporters in class and laugh and distract everyone else. But the ones who really want to learn, they struggle. Why? Because you've got all these jokers who want to muck around in class you always find people who be lazy or do but the people who really are motiv motivated the people who really have a goal the people who are really inspired right you need to surround yourself with these types of people in order to get somewhere allah says if you were to follow the majority of people of earth they will lead you astray you know when they say to me teenagers but everybody does it but everybody does it Did, who, whoever said that truth means you tell the truth by how many people, you know, do it. If everybody walked around with poop all over them, does that mean that we all do it? People walk around naked, do we all go around naked? As they say, that everyone jumped off the bridge, you all jump off the bridge. That's not how you tell the truth. So my brothers and sisters, use this one and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Ibrahim alayhi salam. It is said in the Talmud, in the... Hebrew in the Jewish Bible, the Talmud, and interestingly enough, it's not in the Christian Bible at all. In the Quran and in the Talmud, it is said that Ibrahim alayhi salam had to face the king of Iraq. His name was Nimrod. And the story in the Talmud and in the Quran are very, very similar. It's not in the Christian Bible, and I think I know why. The Mufassirin were saying because the Jews and the Muslims do have a strong monotheistic belief. The Christians have altered it and so they became polytheists under the name of monotheism. Anyway, 
The Talmud also says, the Quran doesn't say this, that it was Ibrahim Aysan's father who went and reported him to the king of the land, that look what my son is doing. And so he was summoned before the king and the king ordered that he be burnt. But we don't know about that story, that's what the Talmud says. Anyway, now comes the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam with this king, whether he was summoned to him or whether Ibrahim, whether the king heard about him and he called him to come along, whether it was reported, we don't know. But the king of the land called and summoned Ibrahim and had him arrested and he was in custody. Ibrahim salam is the father of Tawheed, oneness of Allah in every sense of the, of the word. And it is from him where the word of the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, was established, the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. La ilaha, il, la ilaha is negating. It means I, I reject every other thing that can be, that every other thing that I do not worship anything else. I reject everything else. Illallah, except for Allah alone. That concept of negating and affirming. It was with all the prophets, but Ibrahim alayhi salam put the dots on Allah. He really made it perfectly that way. It was from Ibrahim alayhi salam that la ilaha illallah Muhammad, la ilaha illallah came around. And it was carried in his offspring, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and our ummah and his ummah. He is the one where Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ إِنِّي بَرَاءٌ مِّمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ And be called when Ibrahim said to his father and his people, I am innocent and I reject whatever you worship. إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي Except the one who created me, Allah. See, لا إله إلا الله. And Allah says <clears throat> that He said, "Innahu sayahdin." Allah will guide me. I don't need you. And then Allah says, "Wajalna kalimatan baqiyatan fi atibhi la alhum yarjiun." And we made this affirmation historically in all of His offsprings after Him till the end of time, so that we may be guided. Meaning, in our ummah, in us. La ilaha illallah. Nimrod, the king. Before I talk about him, let's understand something. The people of Babylonia were polytheists. What does polytheist mean? Anyone? What's polytheist? Worship, believe, or worship multiple gods. Correct. Monotheist? One god. The only god. Tayyip. The people of Iraq, including the king Nimrod, they believed in one God. They did. But what did they do that was wrong? They associated, they put other things like God. Like God. So they all believed that God was the creator of the universe. There's two categories of polytheists, of mushrikin, two categories. And they exist till today. Till the end of time. Two categories of polytheists. Number one. The ones who deny a creator to the universe. So what are they making shirk with? Their own minds and their own selves. Then there are polytheists who, they affirm that there's a creator to the universe, but he's a private God. Private. You know, the one you go and worship in the mosques and in the churches and you just pray to him and you give him offerings and you, you turn to him and that's it. But he has no business in the state in our political and social affairs. This is for us. As for political and social affairs, they made other gods. They made kings gods. They made their leaders gods. They made their chiefs gods. Whatever they want, they made them the gods. They are the legislators of earth, but God has no business. And today, this type of polytheism in the West is called secularism, where you separate religion from state. But Allah says, no. I created the universe and I created you and I know exactly what I created and I'm going to guide you. These are the laws that you should be practicing because they are better for you and they ensure justice for everybody. The Quran is the best book of justice. And it is written in Harvard University up in America, subhanAllah, one of the quotes in the Quran that is in Surah At-Tawbah. 
If you go and visit ever Harvard University, you will find in the Faculty of Law, the Building of Law, you will find one of the quotes of the Qur'an carved into the wall. And they say, the Harvard lecturers, they say, and the professors, this is the most profound sentence about justice. The verses in Surah Tawbah, Allah says, Allah commands you to be just and equitable and to place things in their right place, whether it be against yourselves even, or your family, or anyone whom you favor. Right? And there's more about that verse. So they say this is the best ancient scripture that we can find. And they whacked it up there. It's in the faculty of law, the building of law at the Harvard University. So alhamdulillah, they know, they know. The story of Nimrod was that he believed in the creator of the universe, but he considered himself the legislator of the world, not God. Nobody has the right to go above his law, even if they brought it from God or prophets, anyone. So he summoned him and said to him, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكِ Consider that one who argued with Ibrahim about his Lord just because Allah had given him a kingdom. Who did he give a kingdom to? Ibra uh, no, he gave the kingdom to Nimrod, the king. Allah is saying, now this verse came straight after the famous verse we recite. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al qayyum la ta'khudhuhu sinatun wa la in surah al-Baqarah. And then Allah says, uh, he talks about those who disbelieve in the ta'ghud and accept Allah as the only true God and those who follow the ta'ghud and those who follow Allah. Ta'ghud means anyone in power that legislates by, by getting the support of those who do not believe in Allah's legislation. Okay, and so you rule by your own desires and whims, knowing Allah made a law, but you reject it and you say, I am the God of this law. And you follow the supporters of that, they are your allies. So Allah mentions the Tawhut there, and then after that, He gives the example of Namrud. He is one of the Tawarit, which means that He governed based on the support of those who reject the laws of Allah and put their own laws. So Namrud said to Him, uh, he said to Ibrahim about, he asked him about his Lord. He said, tell me who your Lord is. Like Nimrod, he says, look, we know who our Lord is, the creator of the universe. I'm your Lord about laws. So who's your Lord? What kind of a system do you follow? And he said, إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتُ قَالَ أَنَا أُحْيِي وَأُمِيتُ Ibrahim said, alayhi salam, my Lord is the one who gives life and causes death. Beautiful argument. If you want to talk about yourself being a God, then I'm going to give you a test, a question that can only be asked to a God. Didn't he say he's a God? God of laws and legislation and land. He says, all right, well, there are lives on earth. And since you make laws, therefore you punish murderers and you give life and death. My Lord gives life and death. How do you give life and death? Since you think you're a God. He says, I give life and cause death too. So what he did was he brought two prisoners. He said to his guards, kill that prisoner and let that prisoner live. You see, I cause death and let this one live. I'm a God. Ibrahim salam did not mean that. <laughs> he meant bring life from nothing. Cause death and let it turn back into soil. You do it all. Not that. But instead of Ibrahim salam arguing with him about that, he knew an intelligent person doesn't let a person drag you into some stupid argument. He, he didn't mean that. So he goes, okay. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ Well then, Allah brings out the sun from where it comes out. You can see it. فَأْتِ بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ you bring it from the West. Why don't you change it around? Now you might be asking, what kind of a question is that? Remember, Namrud is saying, I'm a God. So he is, has to put a test for him that suits only a God. If he can't pass the godly test, then he's not a God. He says, try and beat my God. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرُ 
he was dumbfounded, the one who denied. Why? He knew he can't bring the sun out from the west. If he answered anything, the people will think, what kind of a puny God are you? True. If you say you're a God with God, then do that stuff. You can't do that stuff. If you're a God, you're a king, you've got authority, don't you dare call yourself a God above God. So why don't you beat him? If you're a king who has authority of the land, then Ali forgot that Allah is the king of the universe who owns it all. You only own a little bit. So what gives you the right to make the laws of the people when it is God who owns it? You get it? So he says, bring out the sun from where it says, <laughs> He was dumbfounded, the one who disbelieved and denied. Now, kafar means he knew the truth, but decides to dig and bury the truth. That's what kufr means. The word kufr, uh, really, before Islam is to be called, the farmers were called kuffar. يُعْجِبُ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ Allah says the farmers like the way plants grow when the rain comes. They're called kuffar. But that means farmers. Kafir means somebody who digs a hole and plants and puts a seed in it. Kafir. Covers it with soil. So when you cover the truth in your heart, you're a kafir. Knowingly. So this is what Nimrod did. Instead, Nimrod didn't want to look like uh, a failed king or god. Instead, what does he do? What does a failed person do? He says, leave. He just got rid of him. So first it said he could have told him, burn him, to burn the truth. Or he told him, get out of here. Because a young boy, 12 years old or 13 years old, with the truth, is the most powerful being on earth. And the king who rules the earth, who is on falsehood, is the weakest person on earth. Very fragile. Always afraid if he'll be caught out. So my brothers and sisters, follow the truth. My brothers and sisters in Islam, today we have a typical, uh, well, not in history, you find that people, when they get into authority, they've, they've always made themselves like gods. The royal families have done this before, and uh, um, they see themselves as the only people who can rule people, and nothing else can. So, my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the story that Allah wants us to know about Ibrahim a.s. So Ibrahim was exiled and he had to leave his land. Only Lut embraced and followed him. On his way, he met a beautiful woman. Her name was Sarah. Sarah, the name Sarah means the one who brings happiness to others. Sarah, surur, happiness, the one who gives happiness to others. So if you've got any daughters, wives, <laughs> wives who are Sarah, <laughs> because I see some brothers who got a wife named Sarah, I hope you, she is a Sarah to you. I hope that she is giving you happiness. So, uh, and you can't change your name. It's too late. Brothers, sometimes you could be, your name could be uh, uh, um, Bassam, which means one who smiles a lot. If you're not a Bassam in your family, you're going to have to change your name. But anyway, Sarah alayhi salam was the one who gives happiness. And truly she was. And she was the most beautiful woman anyone can lay their eyes on in the entire earth on that day. Rasulullah says to us that uh, Hawa was the most beautiful woman and after her was Sarah. Alayhi salam. Ibrahim salam didn't marry her for her beauty. She was the only believer. So he married her for her character. There was one thing about Sarah. Alayhi salam. She was barren. She couldn't have children. Yet Ibrahim salam stayed with her. 80 years. No children from her. We'll get back to this story. Sarah salam, followed him and believed. On his way, he decided to stop by somewhere near Syria. And something occurred to Ibrahim salam. He thought about what Nimrod was saying and life and death. And he believed in life and death, Ibrahim salam. But he wanted something. He's a prophet of Allah. And he knows that prophets always got to see stuff that no one else can see. So that when they go and give the message to the people, they can attest that they saw. Seeing is not like hearing. Isn't that correct? Although Ibrahim Aysan's belief was 100%. 100%. It was like Umar radiallahu anhu. I read from one of the, uh, in the Bidayah wa Nihayah, that Umar radiallahu anhu, I think was Tabari al-Muham, what I mean is that Umar said, if I were to see hellfire in front of me with my eyes, 
it would not make a difference in my belief in it. If I saw it, I believe in it in the same way. Except, however, seeing it, seeing it has a different effect on you. But Iman is something else. Belief is something else. However, the effect on you is something else, right? Your emotions do change when you see things. So he said in a verse, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَلَى وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي قَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِّنَ الطَّيْرِ فَصُرْهُنَّ إِلَيْكَ ثُمَّ جَعَلْ عَلَى كُلِّ جَبَلٍ مِّنْهُنَّ جُزْءًا ثُمَّ دَعْهُنَّ يَأْتِينَكَ سَعْيًا وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah said, and recall when Ibrahim alayhi salam said, My Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said, why? Do you have no faith? Ibrahim replied, yes, I do have faith. But in order that my heart be at rest. In order for my heart to be at rest is just as that. When he goes out to his people, he wants to talk to them with a strong argument which he cannot lie about. He can say, I saw it with my eyes. That's all it means. So that when I talk to the people, I've got a confident backup that I saw it with my eyes because people don't just believe hearsay. They say, did you see it? Yes, I saw it. And then if they believe it or not, it just means that when I say I saw it, your whole argument changes, your tone changes, your energy changes. Isn't that correct? That's why it says I do believe. So then Allah said, then take four birds and tame them. Make them your own until they get used to you. Tame them to yourself. Then after slaughtering them, put a part of them on every hill and call them. They will come to you flying. Know well that Allah is almighty, all wise. So believing and knowing are two different things. He wants him to know and see how mighty and wise Allah is. Allah knows there's a big difference. And this surah is in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 260. And so he did that. He went and slaughtered the birds. He put their heads together with him. And he put a piece and he mixed the birds up. You know, their, their legs and their, their, their feathers and their wings and all of that. They mixed it up and he put them on four different hills. Then he stood where their heads are and Allah said to him, call them. He said, come. And the birds he saw before their eyes, they rolled and came and the earth brought them. They came together before their eyes and each part found its head and they became alive and flew. Towards him on his shoulder and everywhere. This is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the remainder of the story. He walked to, on, his way, on his way to Palestine. Palestine? Jerusalem. He was going there where most of the prophets went. On his way, he passed through Egypt. Mis in Egypt, there was a tyrant king. And he loved women. And Sarah, alayha salam, the most beautiful woman. His guards saw her. And they ran to their king saying, it's like as if they were, they were paid to find him women. He said, we found one of the most beautiful women we've ever seen. But with her is a man. So he said to them, go and ask who he is. If he is her husband, kill him. But if he's not, tell him to nick off. Right? Go. Aussie slang, by the way, nick off means go. Not anyone think I'm swearing. So they went to Ibrahim. On his way, before he got there, Jibril alayhi salam came to Ibrahim alayhi salam and he said to him, there are, these guards will come and ask who you are. They're going to kill you if you say you're, there, you're her husband. So he said to his wife, Sarah, when the guards come to ask you about me, tell them I am your brother. Because if you say I'm your husband, they're going to kill me. Did he lie? We said before that if you give other people an impression of something, 
all right? Then it's not going to work. Isn't that correct? Yes. However, in this case, there was a necessity. Life and death situation. You are allowed to lie if you have been wronged. And it's a matter of life and death situation. And still, Ibrahim Aysan didn't technically lie. I am your brother in Islam. Didn't Allah say, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Believers are brothers and sisters. So in his intention was that, and in her intention was that, but in them, because they don't believe, they didn't know. Again, don't use this excuse to get away with things. Allah knows what's in your heart. We said, if, you are in, if someone has wronged you, and they're going to harm you, and you've done nothing wrong, and you're not going to harm anyone, and it's a matter, it's a series, they're going to seriously harm you, you're allowed to lie about it. And this is what came to the Sirak classes. You remember Ammar ibn Yasir, when his parents were killed in front of him at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then uh, they told him, say bad things about Muhammad and say good things about our gods. And he did, in the end, from the torture and from seeing his parents being killed. And then he was running around in Mecca crying. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw him. He says, Ya Ammar, what's wrong? Your parents are the first martyrs. They're in paradise. Sabr and Ali Yasir, Ali Yasir is going to go to paradise. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I know my parents are in paradise. I know. But that's not what I'm crying about. It's because I swore at you and I mentioned their gods in good. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, if they capture you again, Ya Ammar, let me ask you first, does your heart agree with what you said? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, my heart rejects it. He said, if they capture you again, they tell you to say that, then you say it again. <laughs> say it again. Say it a thousand times more. You see? Matter of life and death. Brothers and sisters, they came and asked her, who is this? And she said, he is my brother. So they told him to go and they captured her and took her. Ibrahim A.S. couldn't do anything. At this point, it's Hasbi Allah. So she went to, the, they took her to the king and she, they brought her in front of him. The king tried to touch her and she made a dua. She said, Allahumma, in kunta, oh Allah, I'll just say it in English quickly. And if you know that I am a pure, chaste woman and that I have not let any man touch me in my life except for my own husband, then do not let this disbeliever, this evil kafir touch me. And suddenly the king's arm became paralyzed. He couldn't move it. And then he said to her, Fukini, release me. I'll tell you why in a minute why he said that. He tried again a second time. She said the same dua. Same thing happened. He said, let me, let me go. Third time, let me go. And then, then he said to his guards, uh, she's a sorcerer. Because they believed in sorcery. Pharaoh, sorcery, all the superstitious stuff. Get her out of my face. And see that woman, that slave woman I've got, one's giving me a headache. Send her with her as a slave so she can never come back. Because he wanted to please Sarah because he got afraid of her. He got scared of her. Allah put ru'ab, put terror in her. And he had this slave, her name was Hajar. And she was such a nuisance, stubborn to the king. He could never get anything out of her. So he sent her with Sarah as well. So he wanted to hit two birds with one stone. Get rid of this nuisance and replace her as a slave. And give Sarah a gift. So in case he believed that Sarah was a sorcerer, she wouldn't, she wouldn't take a lock of his hair and do something for the rest of his life, you know, some voodoo magic. So he let her go, but in fact she asked Allah. And so Hajar became the slave of Sarah, Sarah took her and she treated her well. She treated her, but she was half her age even. And she came back. When she reached where Ibrahim salam was, he was uh, close to Palestine in a hut. She saw him praying. And when he finished, he looked at her and with all ease, <laughs> he says to her, Ma, in the Hebrew language, Ma, or in Aramaic, what happened? She said, Allah saved me. So you can see the true reliance on Allah happening in the story of Ibrahim. He said, let's go. He wasn't worried. He was just praying easily. He knew Allah was going to save him. He knew. So then they went to Palestine and there they settled and called the people to Islam. Time passed. And in saying that, our time is nearly over, but we'll say a couple of more things. Time passed. And Ibrahim alayhi salam became old. 80 something years old. Sarah alayhi salam was both barren, she couldn't have children, and she had passed menopause and grown old as well. She was in her late 70s. Ibrahim salam wanted a child. He wanted a boy in particular. 
and I'll tell you why. Not because he favoured the boy over the girl. It has nothing to do with that. Ibrahim al Salam is a messenger of God. And he's thinking, hardly anyone has believed. In this world that I live in, only a man is able to carry on my legacy to these people and it'll work. A girl will be taken advantage of. She won't be able to get too far. So for the purpose that he wanted the child, which is a noble one, and that is to leave the message of Allah behind him to the people, the legacy of deen, he needed a boy. Why? Because the people are challenging. He would probably need to fight. A girl can't do that. He needs to fight physically. He needs to be humiliated. He needs to go through a lot because look what Ibrahim al went through. So he was afraid of having a daughter and she goes through that. Because you know the father's kindness towards his daughter. Protect her from everything. Whereas it comes to a boy, Ruhya, I said to myself, Ruh, go learn. Nah, stop crying, stop sucking. You little wuss, go outside. You know, fight. Not fight, but I mean, face the world, face the challenge. If someone fights you, you fight back. Daughter, come here. Anyone who touches you, I will wreck them. The opposite way, right? So the boy is different. And he said in the Quran, Rabbi habli min as-salihin in Surah As-Saf. Safat. He said, Rabbi, my Lord, habli min as-salihin. Give me a gift of a righteous, a person, a, a child from among the righteous. It was a boy that he wanted, and Allah says, فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ. And so we gave him good news that he will have a patient boy. Halim. Do you know why Allah said He gave him a patient boy? Halim. Anyone know why He said Halim? Why did Allah give him a patient boy? Halim boy. Anyone? For those of you who came last week, remember when the father of Ibrahim السلام, kicked him out, Ibrahim was so kind and patient. That he, Allah mentions him in the Quran saying, Inna Ibrahim awahun halim. Ibrahim, he sighs a lot. Sigh. Oh, oh. You know, like that? When someone cares about someone, like a parent says it towards their child, they see them going straight. They go, oh, son, daughter, what am I going to do? When you can't do anything else and you care about someone, you sigh. So Allah says, Ibrahim used to sigh a lot for his people, for his father, for everything. Halim, he is so patient and persevering. So we gave him a Halim son, just like him, like father, like son, to carry on his legacy in the same way. Because it also tells us the type of people he was with, they needed tremendous, humongous patience like no one else can handle. So he gave him a boy like him. And now you will see what happens. What did he say? Allah says, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعْيَ When this boy grew up and he became a teenager, able to work with his father, we told him to slaughter him. Now, the story goes like this. Ismail alayhi salam grew up, I'll come back to Hajar, and he started, Ibrahim started seeing dreams, that he's slaughtering his son. So he goes up to his son and he says, I've been seeing many dreams repeatedly that I'm slaughtering you. So what do you think? The Halim boy said, Ya Aba tif'al ma tu'mar. Oh my dear dad. Oh my dear father. Abati. Abati is like, dear father. Oh noble father. Do exactly as you have been commanded. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as You will find me by the will of Allah among the most patient. Now, Halim and Sabir are similar meaning. Sabirin, Halim. Sabirin is a bit stronger. Halim is being patient with people. Sabir on hardships and pain and torture. You're going to slaughter me? I will go all the way through it. Allah. Father and Son. Now let's go back a little bit and I'll finish this insha'Allah. Ibrahim salam saw a dream before that. He saw a dream that he had to take his wife Hajar and his son to the middle of the desert. How did Hajar become his wife? Sarra alayhi salam 
looked at Ibrahim alayhi salam and he was making that dua. Oh Allah, give me a sign. Give me a son. And she felt very sorry for him. So she freed Hajar and gave her as a gift to Ibrahim alayhi salam to marry her as a second wife. So he married her. And even subhanallah, she gifted him as a wife, yet subhanallah, she was still jealous of her. It's the nature of women. Right? Some brothers, they say, oh, my brother, wife is jealous. Like this. Over, overly jealous is crazy. Drive your husband up the wall. Don't, don't do that. Okay? But when he married a second wife and he had to, and she gifted her to him, well, she was jealous of him. She was so jealous of him that there's a hadith in Bukhari that says that she, she asked for Ibrahim to build separate houses. And these separate houses, she used to go out and come back in, Hajar. And Sarah used to see the footsteps of Hajar in some sand sometimes as she's going out and in of the house. So she was so jealous that she said to Ibrahim, السلام, please cover her footsteps. I don't want to see them. <laughs> cover the footsteps even. And she made her wear a, and she wore, Hajar wore something long so that when she walks, it wipes away her footsteps. SubhanAllah. That's the nature of uh, women. SubhanAllah. We've got to be patient with that. And now, brothers and sisters, Sarah gifted, and Allah gave him a son Ismail from Hajar. Then he sees a dream. The son is only a couple of months old. He's got to take them to the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. No houses, no people, no, no animals, no trees, no water, nothing. And he says, you've got to keep them there, drop them there, don't say anything, just walk back by yourself and keep your wife and her and your newborn son in the middle of the desert. 40 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, nothing. So he doesn't say a word. He takes them. We're going on a trip. She obeys him and just goes, oh, my husband going with him is protecting me. Security, beautiful, love, lovey-dovey, nice, worshipping Allah. They reach the middle of the desert where the Kaaba is, of course, where Mecca is, as you know. And then he gets up and starts walking back. So she follows him. Yeah, yeah, Ibrahim. Yeah, Ibrahim. And he wasn't replying to him. Yeah, Ibrahim. And he's walking. It's like 10 meters away. Ibrahim! She's looking at her son. She can't leave her son, so she starts shouting. Ya Ibrahim! She thought, oh my God, I'm not going to be able, he's not going to be able to hear me. Ila man tatrukana. She knew he was leaving them. And she goes, who are you leaving us with? What are you, who, who's with us? Nothing. Ila man tatrukana, who are you leaving us with? And he wouldn't answer. So she started thinking and then something crossed her mind. She said, Ibrahim, Allahu, that's how the hadith goes, Allahu, that's when she's shouting. And you can't say that in Arabic as a question. And he's listening, Allahu, did Allah amaraka bihada? Did Allah command you to do this? So he stopped and turned. He wouldn't look at him because he doesn't want to, be, he doesn't want to lose his, the command. He's get too patient and merciful. He says, yes. No. And he kept walking. So she sat back, sat down next to her son and said, looked up at the sky and smiled. And she said the following words. Ithan, lain yudayya'an Allah. Therefore, Allah will not leave us. He won't lose us. Hasbi Allah and Yamal Wakil goes throughout the story. The story goes on as you know it. She walks between these two hills, single mother, baby, homeless, no income, no food, in the middle of nowhere, lost. Sun starts to cry. She's worried about him, no food, no water. Suddenly she hears a loud noise. Now, you know when she was walking, I'll finish, well, I'll finish it, this is so beautiful. She was walking between these two hills called Safa and Marwa, yes? About close to Safa, maybe 10 meters away, there was a ditch. Like that, and then it goes down, back up. If you were there and you went down that ditch, you can't see the floor anymore. Because it goes down. So if you walk down, if you walk down, your head goes under the, goes to the ditch, you can't see the, the, the floor, the, the, the surface anymore, deeper than your head, right? It's so going down, back up. 
big, massive, um, what do you call it, crater. So she couldn't see her son. What, is it, what would a mother do? She started running fast to get up so she can see her son. Always looking at him. Is he all right? Subhanallah. Now it's all covered. Subhanallah. How Allah has honored Hajar alayhi salam, one woman. When we go and do Safa and Marwa, what do we do between those two green lines? We, we run. We jog. Why? Because of Hajar. Because of a woman. Like, why do we even have to run? What for? Because of her. No other reason. Honoring her. Millions, millions of people every year, Umrah and Hajj, they do Safa and Marwa because of a woman? Who dares say that Islam does not honor a woman? Yes, there are people who don't honor a woman. Culture, people following culture and their ego don't honor a woman and abusive to them. Yeah, those are people. Allah will judge them. But Islam itself honors women? Of course it does. Show me a religion or a culture or a society or a country or a state in the world, in history of the world, who honors a woman like that. Tell it to anyone, brothers and sisters. Challenge them. The only thing they'll come back and say, yeah, well, all right, that's fair enough, but how come I hear about Muslims? This and then you can say, look, it's not only Muslims. A lot of people, people with ego and evil, and God will judge them all. doesn't mean that they represent Islam. Wow. It's been like, what, 6,000 years since Ibrahim a.s. Everybody's been doing that action. Because of that woman, one woman, Hajar alayhi salam. So she comes back and finds Zamzam. We all know the story of Zamzam. I'll talk about it next week, inshallah, more. And she said to it, shrink, because it was too big. So she said, Zummi, Zummi, Zummi. Therefore, the name, Zamzam. Ibrahim, the Prophet Muhammad sallam, says in the hadith which is saying Muslim, he said, May Allah have mercy on our mother Hajar. If she hadn't said to the water, Zummi, it would have been enough for the entire Arab Peninsula. Even though now, look it up on YouTube, The Miracle of Zamzam. All right, it's really good. I'm not going to tell you about it. You look it up. SubhanAllah, it's just an amazing miracle. Allah and Azim. It has never stopped flowing. It's just amazing. And it is food and water. If you drink from it, it's heavy. You can't drink too much because it is actually nourishment. And there are many stories to it. Jibreel alayhi salam had come down in the form of a big man and he stomped his foot into the ground and Zamzam came out. And so... A tribe named Jurhum, they were running away from Yemen because their land, Yemen, was in drought and there was no more food and all that. They were looking for a new place to settle. They see vultures circulating and they said vultures are either there's dead bodies or there's water. They knew the deserts. So they went towards where the vultures were circulating. Allah is guiding them. For who? For that woman and, and that prophet, Ismail. Ibrahim Aysan is not part of it now, right? He went to his other wife. He didn't want to, that's what Allah told him to do. You don't want to leave her alone. But Allah is telling us, listen, do what you can, rely on me. I'm not going to test you the same way as Hajar and Ismail and Ibrahim. I'm just giving you an example of how I can help you if you rely on me. And the help doesn't come quickly, so just be patient and think of me well. Don't worry. Have a positive mindset. Work. Do what you can. And this tribe Jurhum came and lived among them. They wouldn't harm women. Arabs never harmed women if they found her alone because they thought it's a uh, aib, it's, a, it's a, a dishonor to their tribe forever. So they said to her, do you want to share the water? She said, you can pay me to share it. Smart woman, businesswoman. She has to survive, but in the right way. So she took wealth for it and they lived among them until Ismail Ali Salam grew up in front of them. He learned uh, how to catch horses, the wild horses, and tame them. He wasn't the cowboys, guys. It wasn't the cowboys. Is it Texas? No, it's... Where? Dallas, Texas, I don't know, we don't know, it's Americans watching and they'll laugh at us, careful. All I know about cowboys is Clint Eastwood, that's it. I don't know anything else. Remember Clint Eastwood? No? I should have mentioned him in the masjid. I don't even believe him, Allah guide him. Anyway, it was Ismail alayhi salam who tamed horses. He was a true cowboy. And he married from the Arabs, Jurhum, and he became an Arab. He spoke their language. Prophet ﷺ says, whoever speaks the Arabic language fluently is an Arab. That's why Bilal became kind of like an Arab. And so the Middle Eastern people and uh, in those regions, 
they became Arab Mustaraba, which means they became Arabs. Like me, I'm an Arab Mustaraba. Are you? No, the Maghribi. Maghribs are Arabs who came from Ismail, ya Hajj? La, but sent them in Ismail? Moroccans? Three places. I'm not sure Moroccans if they're Arab Mustaraba or whatever, but I know they're all the Middle Easterns. Mustaraba. You are also from Ismail, alayhi salam, mashallah. But the true Arabs, like the Qahtanis and the, and the Banu um, the Adnanis, we spoke about this in the Seerah of the Prophet. Anyway, that's Ismail alayhi salam, and from him came Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, next week, inshallah, I want to talk part three. It's really, really enjoyable and really good to learn the lessons of how he built the Kaaba and what dua he made and, and all that stuff. It's going to be very, very interesting. I have so much to talk to you about next Thursday, inshallah ta'ala. I hope to see you again. I thank you for listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.